Hey, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, a little bit in the dark here way up front, uh, Krista Burns here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event, uh, webinar, webcast, uh, whatever you want to call us. We're a show, we're online, and we're here every Wednesday morning. Um, we do the shows live at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We record all of our shows, and they get posted onto our website. The recordings are out on YouTube, and you can go and watch um, any of our shows um, there at your convenience. If you can't join us on Wednesday mornings. And we do a mixture of things here, book reviews, mini training set presentations, interviews, um, basically anything library-related, we put it on the show. Um, we have a Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations, and we sometimes bring in, bring in guest speakers. Um, and this morning, we have a mixture of that. Um, we have a large group with us today. Um, what we're doing this morning is our annual One Book, One Nebraska show, where we talk about um, the book of the year that we, everyone is reading. Um, this year, it's the Once Upon a Town, uh, The Miracle of the North Platte Canteen by Bob Green. And... Um, I guess I'll just, um, Mary Jo Ryan is here, our communications coordinator at the Library Commission, and Rod Wagner, the director here. And I'm just going to pass the microphone on to you guys, and you can talk about what we're doing and who we all have here today. And okay, um, why don't we just go ahead on. and start on this side of the table, Nancy? If you would introduce yourself. And okay, I am Nancy Johnson from Central City, and uh, I'm here with a friend who was one of the volunteers at the North Platte Canteen, and she'll introduce herself in a moment. I'm Molly Fisher. And I'm a member of the Center for the Book, um, and I, I worked on discussion questions for for this particular book. And that's a good point, Molly. We what, one of the things we do, of course, is offer some assistance for people who want to talk about the book, including Molly's discussion questions and other resources. We'll get to that later. I'm Mary Jo Ryan with the Library Commission. I'm Rod Wagner, director of the Library Commission, and also a an ex officio member of the Nebraska Center for the Book, uh, a sponsoring organization for the One Book Program. And Rosalie. And I'm Rosalie Lippincott, and um, I do live here in Lincoln now, but um, I, um, I'm from Central City as well as Nancy Johnson. And you had a lot of great experiences at, during this time as a, a volunteer in the canteen. Well, uh, not as many as I would have liked to have had. <laughs> I would have liked to have been there every day. But, oh, boy, that would have been a commitment. Yeah. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience, yes. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. And Nancy's going to... My had the, pleasure. We had the opportunity... To Nancy, you had the opportunity to interview Rosalie for a newsletter article that we did um, early in the year. And so we're going to kind of reprise that interview. Nancy's going to ask you some questions later on in the show, if that's okay. Good. <laughs> um, just to kind of go over a little bit more about One Book, One Nebraska, just to kind of fill in people who haven't um, been with us all these years since we've been doing this. Thank you. Um, the, the goal, of course, is to encourage Nebraskans across the state to read and discuss just one book, although we hope they'll read many more during the year, but there's one book that's either written by a Nebraska author or that has a Nebraska theme or setting. And a committee of the Nebraska Center for the Book selected one, the one, 2014 One Book, One Nebraska from a list of 71 titles that were nominated by 141 Nebraskans from across the state. And this year, One Book, One Nebraska was sponsored by the Nebraska Center for the Book, as Rod mentioned, um, Humanities Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Association, and the Nebraska Library Commission. As you can see, since 2005, we've had 10 One Book, One Nebraska um, books that were chosen. There's a real range. There's quite a variety. Everything from classics by Willa Cather to um, a, a mystery by Alex Cava, uh, to a contemporary book by Bill Clefcorn, just a whole wide range of wonderful books that people have had the opportunity to talk about across the state in book clubs and other kinds of activities in libraries, in bookstores, in people's homes. It's been a real rich 10 years of 
reading about Nebraska and talking about the books. Let's focus on this year's 2014 One Book One Nebraska. And that would be, of course, Once Upon a Town, The Miracle of the North Platte Canteen by Bob Green. Now, this is actually a nonfiction story. And uh, Molly, you were saying that you this time when you read it, you'd re read it before, but this time when you read it, you were kind of focusing on how it was organized. Yes, yes. I, I just, I don't know why I focused in on that, but I just was taken with his comparison of North Platte as it was when he was there to the uh, interviews with people as well as the um, interviews with pe workers like Rosalie. Rosalie appears in the book and uh, he would go from an interview with someone that volunteered to someone who passed through but usually in between there would be some geographic location in North Platte that seem to uh, bring forth the interviews. And um, I, got, I got interested in that this time around. Great. Um, do we have a, a... Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Well, we had a little bit of a glitch, and we're just all back together again, picking this up again where we left off. And Molly was talking a little bit about um, the structure of the book, where Bob Green and how he puts the book together, where he interviews people and who people who worked the canteen, like you did, Rosalie, who were the volunteers, people who were on just trains, passed through. just passing through, mm -hmm. and then he he winds it back around to the locations in North Platte and what it's like now, right? Yes, and um, I kept questioning. I I kept thinking that he was. He says once upon a town, but I think he's looking for the town that was. Ah, well that's interesting because one of the things he says is that he was, he set out to find the best America there ever was and he found it in a small Nebraska town. Now he considers North Platte pretty small. I grew up in North Platte and we thought it was a pretty big town. <laughs> <laughs> Rod grew up in a town. How many people in your town? 270. 270 in Rodstown. So North Platte, we think of North Platte as kind of big town in Nebraska, but but it's a you know of course it, it's all rel relative, and and you you live in Chicago like Bob Green does, and I'm sure that North Platte really did seem like a very small town. Um, just to give you a little background, during World War II, American soldiers from every city and walk of life rolled through North Platte on troop trains en route to Europe and the Pacific. And um, it, it seems odd, doesn't it, that the trains just went through that one town. They went through a lot of towns. I got an email last week from a gentleman who was reading along with us on the book, and he was like, you know, I was one of those soldiers on a troop train, and I kept thinking, was it North Platte we went through? He said, no, we went through McCook. He remembered it was McCook. And so he contacted the railroad museum in McCook, and they said, yeah, we had troop trains come here too. So really, not every single troop train went through North Platte, but a lot of them did because North Platte's kind of a hub for the railroad, for the Union Pacific Railroad, which was a passenger railroad at that time, isn't anymore. But the railroad depot, thanks to volunteers like Rosalie, was transformed into the North Platte Canteen. And even years later, long after the war, when I was growing up there, it was famous in our town. It was like a thing we did that everyone remained proud of for their whole lives. And it was always something that people pointed to to show how important volunteerism was and that kind of thing. So every day of the year, every day of the war, the canteen staffed and funded entirely by local volunteers was open from 5 a.m. until the last troop train of the day pulled out after midnight. And the volunteers provided welcome words, friendship, baskets of food, and treats to more than six million GIs by the time the war ended. So it's a pretty impressive roster of events, isn't it? And especially done at a time when people's minds were on other things. Um, I know that a lot of women were working outside the home for the first time in their lives because they'd been called to work in the uh, ammunition factories in Denver and Grand Island. And I also know that a lot of people were, were living on a lot less rations than what they were maybe used to and had to learn to uh, cook with 
ingredients they'd never used. And here they were doing all this as volunteers with all these ingredients. And the book points all that out. So it's a very interesting book to read and a very interesting book to talk about in book groups. And people, by the way, are still... <laughs> there we go. <laughs> people, by the way, are still, of course, because 2014 is not over, they're still talking about this book. They're still reading this book. They're still doing events. I apologize for the quality of this slide that you're looking at, but it just points out that on our website, and we'll go to our website later, I'll show you where, we do have a, a roster of events. And you can see that here in October and coming up in November, there's a number of activities still going on. And they're all across the state. I'm, I'm seeing one in Atkinson, Gordon, Lincoln, obviously, we have our celebration of Nebraska books coming up November 8th. Is that Brewell? I think it's Brewell and Arthur and Hastings. So you're going to see people coming together and continuing to visit about this book and to, to challenge themselves to think about what, what they might have ever done in their lives that would uh, compete, or not compete, but would equal this kind of an effort. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the things that happens when people talk about this book, that um, you find that young people particularly challenging themselves, what can they do to show that they care about someone they don't know? Which, gosh, you know, what more could you want out of a book, right? Mm -hmm. Why, how did this all happen? Well, we did some publicity. And um, Rosalie, you were there at the Capitol when the governor signed the proclamation. Yes. And that was kind of a lovely event, wasn't it? Well, it was. So I felt very honored to be in that group. Well, we are honored to have you, oh, believe yes. me. <laughs> um, that is a, an, a, something we do every year with One Book, One Nebraska. The governor does a proclamation and, and proclaims that everyone should read the book all across the state. And of course, since we all do exactly what our elected officials tell us to do, we all are reading the book. <laughs> and in, and no, we are also putting together book club kits, and we've got a website to help people talk about it. Um, there are also other resources I wanted to point out that are not things that this particular group has put together, but other people put together. For example, in the Nebraska Studies website, there's quite a lot of information about the canteen experiment and the canteen spirit. That's the name of a program that Nebraska Educational Television did, uh, NET, NETV, the canteen spirit, and it's actually on the web. There's resources from the Nebraska State Historical Society and quite a few resources from Humanities Nebraska, including presenters and funding for programming, and that those presenters are still available through the rest of 2014, and hopefully there's still funding available from Humanities Nebraska to support that. And the next thing we were hoping to do is, Nancy, if you would be willing to kind of reprise your interview that you did with Rosalie, and see if um, we could ask Rosalie to remember some things for us, to have some memories she might want to share. Like right about there? OK, and you can tell if we're losing sound. So that'll be kind of a fun thing for us, if you wouldn't mind doing that, Nancy. OK, Rosalie, I know that when you were married to your husband, Dick, you lived at Central City on the farm for over 60 years. Um, but when you worked at the North Platte Canteen, where were you living at that time, and how old were you? <laughs> I, my first visit to the canteen, I was a sophomore in high school, 15 years old. Wow. I lived, of course, with my parents and on the farm that was... Um, northeast of Shelton, small town, <laughs> between, Shelton's between uh, Grand Island and Kearney. So when we talk about the volunteers then that helped at North Platte, we're not talking only about people that lived in the North Platte area. We're talking about people who lived many miles away. Nancy, 125 little towns contributed and helped, and many of them sent people those miles with rationed gas and rationed tires. 
And didn't you also go on the railroad, on the train? Well, the Union Pacific offered us from Shelton, I don't know whether that pertained to other towns, but from Shelton, if we were at the railroad station at 3.30 in the morning, oh, we could have a free ride to North Platte. So that, that way the railroad contributed in more than bringing the soldiers in or the Absolutely. military people. They also helped to take the volunteers yes. to North Platte. And many people may not realize that. Yes. So what what jobs did you have at the canteen and what foods did you help prepare? Well, my first job was to uh, arrange books and magazines on a long table and make those books and magazines look appealing for the fellows to pick up. And um, let's see, that took um, a couple hours maybe to do that because um, after I got done with the books, then my job was to crack hard-boiled eggs and peel them and make egg salad sandwiches. And Nancy, the, what I'm telling you are, is absolute fact because I saved a letter, happened to save a letter that I had written to my boyfriend who was stationed in Germany at the time. And the letter is dated March 1945, I guess it was. And this, the things I'm telling you are the things that I had written in that letter. So I know that they were facts. And continuing about the egg salad sandwiches, at that particular day, we made 20 bushel baskets of sandwiches and, you know, put them in the old-fashioned bushel baskets, lined the baskets with clean tea towels, then covered the sandwiches with another tea towel and stuck them under the table, waiting for the train to come in. No Ziploc bags in those days. <laughs> no plastic bags. <laughs> and still, somehow, you got a long time. That's for sure. Uh, how many, you know, they say that there were as many as 7,000 troops go through a day. How many would 20 bushels be? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that probably didn't feed 7,000. But it was, it was a start. Yeah, my letter um, said that we served uh, eight troop trains that day and that there was probably 5,000 um, people. And it wasn't just the egg salad sandwiches. There were bushels of apples and oh, whatever you could get. Was cakes. I heard cakes. about birthday cakes. Name it. And it was there. <laughs> you know, coffee, milk. Um, in little um, pint, I guess those are. Mm -hmm. I don't Little See, glass, were they glass, I suppose? Yes, yes. glass. Uh -huh. So wow. someone had to wash those when one train would leave. Yes. And they'd fill them up again for the that, next group. Yeah. You know, if they carried him on the train, at the next stop, the conductor would have collected those uh, bottles and then sent them back on the next train coming back into North Platte. And we'd have cups and bottles and little plates because there were absolutely no paper products right. at that time.
And that's one of those things that we don't think about, that those and hey, you know, have to be brought back. What, what I think about, we didn't wear rubber gloves. Yeah. <laughs> we just handled please. It's a wonder we didn't. <laughs> well, you probably washed your hands good, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, in the book, you mentioned that there were some romances that you had heard about that had started among the military people that came and some of the girls at the station? Well, yeah. Um, the one in particular that I know about um, came about between a yeah, soldier and a young girl who grew up in Tryon, Nebraska. Tryon is up in the Sand Hills, 75 miles or so from North Platte. It's way out there in the boonies, but it's a wonderful little town. And those ladies, you know, made popcorn balls. And then they put the name and address of single girls <laughs> in that community and passed them out. Well, one romance developed between um, a soldier and a young Tryon girl by just letter writing. And when they finally were face to face, I guess it was love at first sight, <laughs> wow. because they were married very shortly after. And her wedding dress hangs in the uh, museum out in North Platte. So they were married and had a family. And so that romance is documented at the museum. Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, you know, who knows what else went on. I don't. <laughs> now, now, you were a young girl and all these good-looking servicemen were coming through there. Were you tempted? <laughs> well, I was enjoying the, you know, uh, excitement. And it was, um, it was a thrill. For a teenage girl to be in the midst of all those uniformed guys. But no, Nancy, I was not tempted because I already had my eye on a hometown boy. <laughs> Ended up marrying him. And, <laughs> and you were married for how many years? Loving him for 62 years. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, That's wonderful. Rosalie, wonderful. Did, I, I just wondered how all of this could happen in 10 minutes. Were they really there for just 10 minutes? Well, yeah, the trains, you know, the trains stop to take on water and fuel and, so it, and change crews sometimes. And so those stops were only about... 10, 15 minutes, and boy, when that train whistle blew, those guys went out running. Did you dance with any of the... I, no, I didn't dance. <laughs> I see the pictures of them dancing. <laughs> well, you know, Jitterbug was popular, and there was dancing going on, but... Um, I, I just never did dance, and so, I, no, I was busy making, making. egg salad sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> you were. <laughs> now, Rosalie, we're discussing this uh, with you because of Bob Green's book, Once Upon a Town. Did you meet with Bob Green when he was writing the book, since you are in the book? The answer to that question is no. I did not face-to-face -face meet him. The way I met him was I had a couple years before this all took place, I had written my memories of the canteen, just simply so that someday my children 
and grandchildren would know some of the activities that I had participated in. So when I learned through my sister, who lived in North Platte and took the North Platte paper, there was an article um, that said Bob Green was interested in co contacting and hearing from people who, who had worked in the county. So I thought, well, holy smokes, I've got that all written, uh, you know. And so I just put it in and wrote and sent it to, him, to his office there. And it wasn't very long until I had a telephone call from his office. And um, the girl said, you know, would you talk to Bob Green? And I said, oh, oh my goodness, yes, I'd talk to Bob Green. So we had probably a 25, 30 minute chat on the telephone. And I told my husband after we'd had that talk, I said, you know, Dick, I think that's the first time anybody has actually ever listened to what I had to say. <laughs> it was just he was a good listener, huh? It was yeah. just delightful talking to him and very easy to talk to him. And that's so that's line. how I met Bob Green. But when we did a book signing out in North Platte, then I met him and I had my picture taken with him. And he signed your book. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But you cannot read his right oh, no. <laughs> You have to know that it was Bob Green. <laughs> and your story is one of the ones that's really compelling, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you read this, when well, you read Once Upon a Town. You know, see it and then. My story is the first story that he tells. It's on page 19. <laughs> <laughs> so, even if you don't read the whole book, read page 19, get Rosalie's story. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, you, now you said that he was the first person who listened to you tell about your story. Um, I believe that since the book came out, that you have told your story to probably close to 50 different groups of people? I got started talking about it after a neighbor lady uh, was a uh, program chairman for her group of ladies and she needed a program. And she said, you're going to talk about the canteen. I said, oh, that, I did. <laughs> I got started doing it. And uh, so far, I've given that 45-minute presentation about 45 times to groups, all kinds of groups. Can I tell you about the most Thrilling one. Yeah, sure. <laughs> tell us about that. Again, men in uniform. I gave my presentation to the crewmen of the nuclear sub Nebraska. Oh, wow. And uh, <laughs> it was just the most wonderful evening. At the end of the, my talk, those fellas paraded up, gave me a hug and a kiss, <laughs> and made me an um, honorary crewman of the nuclear sub. Wow. And then they presented me with the dolphin pen, which I learned is a very coveted pen among the sub people. And then um, another group that absolutely floored me were a middle school group here in Lincoln. 
And the, the teacher had, the kids all had read the book. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think we didn't have a good interchange there of information, it was delightful. Well, you're delightful. And <laughs> we're so, here. <laughs> and we're so glad that you have had the privilege for you, but privilege for everyone you've spoken to, to bring this history to them. So thank you so much. Well, I'll tell you what, at my age, it's been just absolutely wonderful well, experience. We appreciate yeah. this. Now, now, your talk can be seen on YouTube, is that correct? Oh yes, the, the, your entire talk. Yeah, it's and on what YouTube. what do people need to look under for that? Under your name, right, Rosalie Lippincott? Lippincott. Just Lippincott. Canteen. L Lippincott Canteen. Or Canteen Lippincott. Search. Search. But that you know what? That was um, <laughs> about the first first time that I had given that talk. <laughs> I think. Today, I could do it much better than what some of you Okay, then, then we'll tell people if they have the opportunity to hear you speak, they should go. Absolutely. Okay. I, I've kind of run out of dates. My booking agent has been <laughs> She's pointing to her son, who has yes. been turned into the booking agent. Yes. <laughs> right, right. And driver. <laughs> and daughter-in-law, too. <laughs> They're your booking agents, right? Yeah. I, perfect. Yeah. perfect. Well, thank you very much. Um, and, and that is a good note for us to move on to encouraging people to continue to get involved with this book. Because even though we're starting to talk about what's going to be the 2015 One Book, One Nebraska, we're still in 2014, and there's still time to schedule a book club or a book talk, book a program like Rosalie's, have her come to your group. Um, you're still available, and we will put your contact information up on the website so that people know how to get to you. Um, we also are encouraging people to still go and do local radio and TV talk shows. They're still looking for great stories, and this is a great story. Um, and then also, we want to really encourage everyone to join us at the November 8th celebration of Nebraska Books. And that's going to be from 3.30 to 6.30 here at 12, 1200 Ann Street. That's the Library Commission here in Lincoln. And um, we'd also invite you to join us for the Center for the Book Annual Meeting, which is an hour before that at 2.30. The celebration always includes an awards reception, book signings, and the announcement of the 2015 One Book, One Nebraska Book Choice. But before we move on to that, Krista, if you wouldn't mind sending me over the mouse, I'm going to show people what resources are available on your website. Just want to point out that we do have a website. Let me see if I can find it. Is that it? No? Yep, that should be it. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. I just want to point out that we do have a website. It's onebookonenebraska.gov. Oh, wait. No, it's not. Oh, man. It's onebook.nebraska.gov. Sorry. <sighs> anyway, onebook.nebraska.gov. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Am I yeah, reading it right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll have it included in the show links. After yes, it'll be in the links so you can get yes. to it correctly. <laughs> Sorry. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of resources on here. A little description of the book. A little information about the author. Um, we were just talking, uh, remembering that uh, Bob Green did a weekly uh, column for years and years and years, and now he's actually doing an online column. He's doing a CNN blog column. Um, and then there's this section called Get Involved. And this is the section I really wanted to point out to anybody who's still thinking about doing any programming with 2014 One Bookman Nebraska. There's a toolkit here which has a whole lot of resources and a whole lot of materials that can help people put a program together. And that's for librarians, for teachers, for just 
individuals who have a book club they want to use this for. Um, there's discussion questions, which Molly mentioned she worked on early in the year. Lesson plans and activities, these are a little more school oriented, but you can pick things out of them for adults and pick things out of them for groups. Um, and then there's also a community on Facebook, One Book, One Nebraska, and we get a lot of really interesting comments on Facebook about programs people have seen. And like I said, I got a comment from someone who was trying to rack his brain to think if he had been through the North Black Canteen, and then he remembered he was at the Book Cook Canteen. <laughs> um, you can also obviously find a copy of the book. If you can't see a re or you can't see to read regular print or hold a book, we do have the book available um, in digital format through our talking book and braille service. And so that's something to keep in mind that if you have a customer, a library customer, that can't hold a book or can't see the regular print, we do have it available through talking book and braille. And then we also have these book club kits that many of you are familiar with. We actually have now, what, over 800, is that, is that right, 800 yeah. and some book club kits? This is one of them. And you can borrow a number of books for your book club. And you, you do this through your local library, or the local library does it for you, and borrows them for, through us, and we uh, send them out, and you have them for as long as your book club needs them, and then turn them back in, and we send them to another book club. So another thing to remember is that there is this Humanities Nebraska Speakers Bureau option. Um, there's also, oh, um, one of the things I wanted to point out, Rosalie mentioned that the wedding gown and the wedding pictures of the couple who were met through the popcorn ball are at the Lincoln County Historical Society Museum. There's also an online exhibit that you can link to right from our page. And it's the Lincoln County Historical Museum online exhibit on Canteen. And the Lincoln County Museum has had several activities this year. They have. In conjunction with the book. With, it, we've actually gotten a lot of, of great activities going on. The, Link, the Nebraska Tourism um, Council had their annual tourism meeting in North Platte this year, and the canteen was the spirit. The canteen spirit was the um, theme of their of their conference, and so one of the things that's happened because one book one Nebraska has a lot more interest in the canteen and interest in the book. So that's all good. I think the Union Pacific has a a, a canteen exhibit too at the Durham Museum, Museum in no. Omaha. Oh, wait, yeah, it's in Council Bluffs. Now. Oh, in Council Bluffs now. Oh, and okay. It's it's a smaller exhibit, but. Uh, and I have not seen it, but uh, I know I I would encourage people to on this end of the state if they need to. I would sure go to the North Platte Canteen exhibit. Yeah, uh, if you have a chance. Well, and there's other things here. There's um, I believe there's Rosalie's video is on here. If it's yeah. not, we will get it on here. Do you see it? Yeah. There it is. Rosalie Lippincott on the North Platte Canteen. That's the video that's on YouTube. Um, there's other videos on YouTube, um, and here's somebody performing his own song, telling the story. So, I mean, the thing about this book and this story is it has inspired many people, not just those of you who had this experience, Rosalie, but th here's a guy who wrote a song about it, you know? It's been a, it's been a great, um, so, something for us to all look up to, I think, that people like you were willing to do so much for people you didn't even know, which is really a beautiful thing. Um, and so if you go on through down the page, you can see that we've gotten a few articles and some, there's been some interest. But one of the things that we really encourage is that if you're doing an event, be sure and pro promote it and let us know. And here are just some of the events that we knew about and put up on our calendar through the year. And you can see it has been well received. There's been a lot of interest. But please don't think that doesn't mean that, that it does not mean, just because it's been well received, it does not mean that there's still not time. Here's a program in Beatrice, I love this, Candy of the 1940s, talking about what you did in, 19, in the 1940s to still have candy, which I think is just great. I mean, people have taken a lot of creative attitude towards this. Once again, to point out that uh, coming up um, here on November 8th, is the Celebration of Nebraska Books here in Lincoln. And we'll be featuring the canteen as well as announcing the 2015 book. So um, just, if anybody has any questions, have you gotten any uh, questions, Krista? Or if anybody would like to share, or anybody who's out there would like to share either your canteen memory, if you remember the canteen yourself, or um, anything you'd like to share about 
doing the book discussion either in your library or in a bookstore, <laughs> in your home, if you've been, or if anything you'd like to share about this 2014 One Book experience. Well, just give you a minute. <laughs> I have a question. I keep wondering what can even compare to this. What what do we have that is in volunteerism today that can can compare to what happened in those years? I do not know. I mean, I was just amazed. <laughs> if they didn't have meat, they used pheasants. They had pheasant sandwiches. Yeah, um, it was funny. Somebody said in season when the pheasants were in season. Pheasants were shot, and we made pheasant sandwiches. And then somebody else said, well, sometimes when they weren't in season, we <laughs> shot it too. <laughs> and eggs, eggs to make the cake. Eggs, yeah. They used different, uh, you know, not just chicken eggs. Mm -hmm. uh, turkey, turkey eggs. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it takes as many turkey eggs to make. <clears throat> I wouldn't think yeah. so. You know, yeah. usually you measure by the cup. Yeah. Either Chickens, it takes different yeah. number of eggs to make a cup of egg whites that make your inch of food cake. I just wonder what what we can compare this to today. Uh, I mean, people were so giving. They, they used their rations for the soldiers. Uh, that was the thing, because people were giving up things anyway. Yes. And then what little sugar or the tires on your car if you were going to drive in. People really did give and give and give. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing about it is it was such a big effort. Just like you mentioned, all those towns all around, yeah. as opposed to maybe you could think of things right now that, that are amazing examples of volunteerism, mm -hmm. Mother Teresa's work, but you know, you think about this, this was so many people. I mean, it was just so many people who came together, and that I think is is what makes it so special, in part, because there were so many people who stepped up. And they were willing to volunteer for so long. I mean, if we yeah. do a volunteer activity, we well, say two hours, and then I'm done. <laughs> Or when will the project be over? <laughs> you know, uh, I, we talked about having the free ride on the train if we were at the station at 3.30. Well, then we didn't get on a train in North Platte until almost 11 o'clock at night. It was 1 o'clock when we got back to Shelton, so that was 22 really? Hours. Yeah, that is really a long day for those young people. Well, even at 15, it was a long, <laughs> tiring day. Uh-huh, yeah. But you did it and felt good about doing it. What, what has always struck me, though, is the, uh, it's like trying to imagine anything comparable, but this happened over every day over a long, long period of time, years. Mm -hmm. that, that's it's just so extraordinary. It's just beyond comprehension to me that, that, that there was that kind of ongoing, sustained commitment from people to do that. It's just remarkable. Well, a miracle. And, yeah, just like he says, a miracle. <laughs> and how it got moving so quickly, mm -hmm. you know, just almost overnight. That way, Wilson put a letter in the paper. They called the meeting. She got nominated as chairman. And then that was early in December. But at Christmas, the canteen was moving. Wow. It is amazing. It is amazing. And I think. It's inspirational, and I love that you mentioned that the middle school kids had a lot to say about this, because obviously this is well removed from their history. They don't know much about it until they read a book like this, and it all becomes real to them. 
You know, it's just such an awesome part of Nebraska history mm -hmm. that everybody ought to be talking about yes. it. Yes. I think yes. so, too. And I think sometimes when people talk about it, they talk about it in terms of patriotism, which was, of course, a very big part of it. That's one of the reasons why people step forward. But I think, it, to me, it's a story of caring about human beings you don't even know. Yes. Which I just think, it's one thing to help your neighbor. It's another thing to, to be strong, so strong in your humanity that you're willing to just step forward for people you'll never see again, who don't know you from a load of goats, mm -hmm. but here you are and here they are and you've intersected in their lives and you're going to do something for them. It's and the, beautiful. The soldiers mentioned that over and over again, that they didn't know us and they treated us all the same with dignity and respect. And they really cared, you know, they kept saying, they could see it in people's eyes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. So as you can tell, those of you who are out there, you can tell that we definitely recommend you read this book this year. If you haven't, do it. If you haven't, it's time to read it. Because it's going to be, we got another couple of months of 2014, plenty of time to read it, plenty of time to discuss it. Librarians, if you're looking to get a book club kit, you can contact our reference desk. Um, if they can't get it, well, I know there's there's some kits out in the systems too, so contact us or the, or the systems and we will definitely get you a book club kit for your group in your town. Um, anything else anybody would like to share for the good of the group? <clears throat> No questions have come in. No questions. No. Okay. So well, yeah, we do have a bunch of different libraries listening in, so hopefully they'll get some ideas and have fabulous. some events that they'll either have at their own library or participate in. Very good. Very good. Well, I put the screen up just to remind you again what the address is for the website, because now it's big enough I can actually <laughs> see it. Onebook.nebraska.gov. <laughs> and then the Facebook page, for those of you on Facebook, it's uh, www.facebook.com, One Book, One Nebraska. So I'm definitely recommending that you take a look at those resources, see how this works with your group, with your community, and um, stay tuned. Join us at the celebration November 8th to find out what's next year's book. Anything okay. else? Thank you all. Thank you, all right. Rosalie, Thank so you. much. It was a pleasure to have you here with us today. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Is microphone? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, everyone um, who is here in the room and are um, in the background, <laughs> helping make this all come all happen. Um, that was great. The show has been is being recorded. Um, we did have some technical difficulties earlier, briefly, but we've got two recordings that we will put together and make one one awesome one to put out. Um, thank you, Chris. And Not a problem. All I figure can it say out. is thank God you're here to take <laughs> care of the problem. <laughs> There's a show you something. Oh, sure. Yeah. Tell us about photographs. Absolutely. Um, one of those uh, men. Yeah, he, has been identified positively as uh, he was from back east, I can't tell you where, but um, he ended up coming back to Nebraska. His name is John Zug, and um, he lived, uh, spending, spent his working years in Cozad, I think it was really? The, uh, he came back to Nebraska after the war and worked in Kozad? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh. Uh-huh. And um, he, he did pass away, not just...